Thank you so much, all of you, for coming to our roundtable, Global Cartographies of Dispossession, Borders, Citizenship, and Crises as a Catalyst for Solidarity. So um, our panel, uh, I'm just going to read the panel description and then a few comments, and then we'll proceed to the questions for our pa great panelists today. So in 2019, the UNHCR reported a record-breaking 70.8 million displaced people worldwide, while the organization United for Intercultural Action reported that at least 37,000 refugees died between 1993 and 2019, attributable to the fatal policies of Fortress Europe. Countless others have gone missing in the perilous migration routes to the global north, the main drivers of forced migration are violent conflict, structural exclusion, elitist economies, unsustainable development, and climate change. War and militarism, the global right turn, and nationalist populism, a system of ca racial capital and environmental degradation, have all led to the contemporary crises of global displacement. The numbers of displaced people worldwide has steadily increased since World War II due to imperialist wars, neoliberal economics, and racial capitalism. Uh, as political earthquakes spiraled in the wake of the 2008 recession as well, the international, international community paid little attention to the growth of these displaced communities, the causes of such vast global movement, or the catastrophes displaced people continue to endure. Meanwhile, international agencies and state actors continue to neglect the crises or their root causes. causes. While sporadic global attention is brought to bear on the Syrian refugee crisis in particular, and to Central American migrants trapped in detention centers along the US-Mexico border, the debate is generally limited by place-specific contexts or by the racialized rubrics of legal asylum regimes that may often soften the blow of structural violence and regulate exclusion, but never eradicate this violence. As an aware and as awareness increases, so too do the discourses of emergency that often serve to further the militarization of borders. Our panel today engages questions of displacement, utilizing a global framework that will place various ethnic, national, and racial communities and geographic coordinates into conversation with one another. The, our panelists center the narratives of those affected by the extremities of the crisis, the survi survivors of trafficking industries, those exiled as a result of war, occupation, and violence, indigenous peoples displaced by land dispossession, to understand how the depths of the disaster may also enable new forms of solidarity between affected communities. Our panelists address how climate disasters, racial capitalism, war and militarism, nationalist populism, and settler colonialism combine to regulate people's mobility across borders, access to citizenship and human rights, and ultimately, refugees' freedom and full personhood. Displaced indigenous, refugee, migrant, and racialized peoples from across the world are articulating the limits of the nation state, as well as the possibilities that emerge if we dream collectively, envisioning and organizing its alternative. So our panelists bring together analytics from an array of places and communities, from the US-Mexico border, from Palestine, Syria, and Iran, and Afghanistan, through the Greek islands, and beyond. Briefly, I would like to add a few of my own thoughts about the migrant future that is already with us. The world temperature has already reached 1.2 to uh, 1 to 1.2 degrees Celsius of warming beyond the temperatures that have ever been known before in human history. And we will see that double by the end of the century to 2 to 2.5 degrees Celsius of warming. This is inevitable. It cannot be reversed. And while it is catastrophic warming, things will definitely get worse before they stabilize, it's not nearly as bad as climate scientists had originally predicted. Five to 10 years ago, climate scientists expected us to reach between four to five percent, four to five degrees Celsius of warming by the end of the century. 
So this means that we have already cut our expected temperature rise in half, and we have done this remarkably quickly. Thanks to the global political mobilization and to the fact that the price of renewables, solar and wind, has fallen between 60 and 80 percent in the last 10 years, and the cost of batteries for storing energy have also dropped proportionally. So renewables are now considerably cheaper than dirty energy. Solar power is, in fact, the cheapest uh, energy in modern history. According to climate journalist David Wallace, the apocalyptic future for the Earth that we thought was coming just five years ago may very likely have already been averted. Nevertheless, while we are going to have a more manageable future, this means different things to different parts of the world. The level of warming is something that rich nations will be able to manage in 50 years or so. It will be the new normal. But this level of warming that will be much will be much more harder for nations in the global south, especially along the equator. These poorer economies will simply not have the financial resources or access to the technologies to manage the degree of catastrophe that we will experience with 2 to 2.5 uh, degrees Celsius of climate change. So as usual, the global north, responsible as we know for the lion's share of global emissions, will be able to part protect ourselves. But how will, we, how will um, we respond to the devastating consequences in the global south? That's a question for future for the, uh, for the future that is already here of migration uh, to the global north. And meanwhile, uh, do you want to know how many refugees have been admi admitted to the US in the year to date? Uh, Republican candidates, as you know, are running on this all over the country. Uh, you know about the criminal refugees overrunning our borders. But the U.S. this year has admitted only 25,500 refugees, and that's double of last year. Uh, of course, as we know, 17 to 21,000 asylum seekers have already been sent to New York City, which is a good thing, as our policeman, Mayor Eric Adams, never tires of saying, all he needs is for those asylum seekers to get their work permits yesterday because there are incredible shortage of surface work workers in our city, busboys, wait staff, stalkers for grocery stores and bodegas, construction workers, newest New York City is chomping at the bit to exploit these refugees. And of course, the irony is that after uh, Rick DeSantis sent all of those refugees to us in New York City, after Hurricane Ian, he had to employ undocumented migrants to rebuild Florida. In, uh, it's probably not a surprise, surprising absolutely nobody at all. Turkey, Colombia, Germany, Pakistan, and Uganda are actually the top refugee receiving countries in that order. The US does not even make the top 10. So our panel today is a step towards decentering the United States in the global conversation about migration to think about the flight of refugees in a global frame. So I'm gonna introduce, are we going in order of the bios? So who's going first? Okay, all right. So um, I would first like to introduce um, Lubna Katani, Katami, an associate professor in the Department of Asian American Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Katami is the former president's postdoctoral fellow from the Department of Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley 2018 to 2020, and she received her PhD from the Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Riverside. Go UC! Um, Katami's research examines transnational Palestinian youth movements after the 1993 Oslo Accords through the 2011 Arab uprisings. Her work is based on scholar activist ethnographic research methods. Katami's broader scholarly, interest, broader scholarly interest include Palestine, critical refugee studies, the racialization of Arab Muslim communities in the United States, settler colonialism, youth movements, transnational and indigenous and third world feminisms. She is co-founder and an alumni of the Palestinian youth movement and is currently a member of the Palestinian Feminist Collective. Okay, um, our next speaker going down the panel is Alborz uh, Gandahari, an assistant professor of ethnic studies at the University of Utah. His research interests center social movements in Southwest Asia, North Africa, their diasporas, and their international solidarities with related global struggles. His forthcoming book, 
post-revolutionary conditions, renewed hopes of the Iranian freedom struggle, brings together oral histories with grassroots organizers across Iran's contemporary labor, student, and women's movements with resistance literature and art to argue that since the 1979 revolution, Iranians have continued to resist both the authoritarianism of the Islamic Re Republic as well as imperialisms of foreign powers in order to fulfill their long-time struggle for radical self-determination. A second research area for Albors centers around migrant justice struggles transnationally. Some of his writings appear in the Journal of Middle East Women's Studies, Critical Ethnic Studies Journal, Social Identities, Frontiers Journal of Women's Studies, Jadalaya, and Descent Voices. Um, our uh, third panelist is Cynthia Martinez Perez. She is a Chancellor's Doctoral Fellow in the Department of Latin American and Latino Studies at UC Santa Cruz. Her book project, Ice on Fire, Incinerating Prisons, Border Violence Through Feminist Abolition Geographies, draws from the border immigration, draws from border immigration studies, critical carceral studies, and feminist theory to examine how migrant women refuse and resist the historical, discursive, and epistemic erasure of gendered violence in ICE immigration detention centers. Her work focuses on Adelanto ICE Detention Center, which she also organized and volunteers to support migrants fighting their asylum cases. Then Cynthia employs an archival and ethnographic analysis to resituate detained migrant women's writings as anti-carceral and feminist abolitionist praxis that counter the state's diligent efforts to conceal gendered violence from the historical record. Through a critical reading of migrant women's hunger strikes, demand and personal correspondences, Cynthia locates migrant women as authors of abolitionist praxis. So I'm going to start us off with our first question for the panelists. Uh, would each of you tell us a little bit about the refugee and migrant communities you've worked with, you know, giving us a sense of their context and conditions that are forcing them to flee their format, their for homelands? So should we just, oh right, we've got to move it. Um, well, thank you so much for that beautiful framing and introduction, and um, thank you all of you for being here this morning. So regarding the first question, my, my research is I'm organizing um, on Palestine, transnational organizing with the Palestinian youth movement, that I, I have to say I almost stumbled upon um, this other area of work, which is really thinking about um, the relationship between Palestinian refugees and global refugee communities. Um, part of that happened because when I went to go do my field work in Palestine, like so many other Palestinian scholars, I was denied entry into Palestine. And so really needed to think of a different way to do research, um, which meant connecting with comrades and friends and organizers in all of the places that Palestinians, refugees and exiles do connect. Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, um, across Europe, uh, especially um, at that time. And it was in that moment that, you know, I could have kind of stayed directly on the path of trying to explore Palestinian youth organizing, the new migrations of Palestinian youth from Palestine, Syria, and Lebanon to Europe, but I couldn't actually disentangle the question of Palestinian um, arrivals to Europe as a result of the, that, the catastrophes of that moment, this was about 2016, from the broader wars, authoritarianism, economic crisis, um, climate catastrophes that were driving out so many other people through the Mediterranean. And so I really appreciate this panel because it actually gives us a chance to think about specificity of context and communities and, and, and struggles while also drawing crucial linkages, both in the structures that are driving people out of their homeland, and also in the solid solidarities that already exist and the potential ones that can be forged. So I wanted to start off just by saying that. The main drivers today of what's driving Palestinians off of their land, as many of you probably here know, is that we are now in the 75th year of living under a settler colonial occupation that was established uh, by the Zionist state in 1948. Um, in 1948, nearly two-thirds of our population were expelled from our lands, about 750,000 Palestinians. Today, they 
that the original 1948 refugees and their descendants now comprise about six million Palestinian, um, Palestinian refugees and exiles who live outside of Palestine. We are what the United Nations, and I'm not saying this because I believe that they give us the stamp of approval, but we are what the United Nations calls the longest refugee community in modern history. Um, and what that means is that for 75 years, this is a community who's never acquired another form of rights-bearing citizenship. And so their mobility cards, for many of them, are issued by the United Nations. Um, in many of the countries where they reside, health and education services are administered by the United Nations, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, and they haven't been naturalized in their host states, and they've been denied the right to return to their homeland in accordance with UN Resolution 194, which ensures their right to return um, all the refugees of 1948. So that means that when we're talking about Palestinian refugees moving now, we have to account for many different groups. There are Palestinians in the homeland who continuously are leaving the homeland because of the military occupation of the West Bank, which continues to confiscate Palestinian lands. Um, it's a kind of a, a constellation of roadblocks, checkpoints, and settlements I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, and that forces Palestinians to live in a carceral regime, what people call the largest open-air prison. And then there's a siege on the Gaza Strip. Now, the Gaza Strip is actually what's producing the largest amount of northbound migration. Um, Gaza has been militarily occupied since 1967. In 1993, the Israeli state imposed a full enclosure on the Gaza Strip. And then in 2007, that enclosure became a deadly strangulation by land, sea, and sky, where no one is allowed to leave or enter, um, and where a lot of Gaza's infrastructure has been completely destroyed in the various wars that have um, commenced since 2007. I think it's five wars now, major wars. So Gaza is producing the largest number of Palestinian refugees that are leaving Palestine, um, but because they don't have an airport, they're leaving by route of sea through North Africa um, and paying smugglers, I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but paying smugglers in order to move through North Africa toward Europe. The second largest group of Palestinian refugees that are fleeing are Palestinians of Syria. These are Palestinians from the nine refugee camps of Syria and three uh, official gatherings who have left as a result of a number of sieges and destructions to the camps in Syria that's happened as a result of the war, mostly implemented by the Syrian regime. And the last largest group of Palestinians who are fleeing uh, northbound are uh, Palestinians from Lebanon who are struggling with political and economic crisis in the camps, um, particularly because Lebanon itself is undergoing a major economic crisis um, that it hasn't come back for, from for some time. Um, all three groups, because they lack uh, citizenship and it's very difficult to acquire visas and all that stuff, which many affects m many communities, are leaving by route of sea. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Professor Saldana Portillo, for those uh, really wonderful opening comments, and Lobna for, for starting us off um, with such a powerful uh, framing as well. Um, yes, uh, so I feel like crouching down a little bit. but um, So my comments today are focused on a migrant justice oral history project that I and many, many others, it's a very collaborative project um, that we've created which really uplifts uh, this question of how to build internationalist solidarity uh, around freedom of movement and migrant justice globally, worldwide, beyond borders. Um, and so this is a project, the roots of which began uh, when I took part in a delegation with, with Lubna uh, in 2017 to Greece um, that was organized by uh, Swana Connect, which is an organization um, you know, that uh, organizes refugee support uh, delegations and solidarity work. Um, and uh, on that trip, I met uh, Hamed Ganji, uh, who is uh, who is an organizer in Greece, 
um, and took part in a refugee squatters movement uh, at City Plaza Hotel, which was a closed down hotel um, that closed down in 2010 as a result of the European financial crisis. Um, and was taken over by refugees and other solidarity activists, local solidarity activists, um, as part of this squatters movement uh, to uh, take over the hotel and convert it to much gravely needed refugee housing. Um, so it was a grassroots autonomous movement. Um, and there are many other squatters movements like it in, in Greece and, and across Europe, and we'll talk about some of those later. Um, but Hamid and I talked about uh, the need to build solidarity uh, across borders between movements in the Americas, in you know, you know, facing the violence of the U.S.-Mexico border regime, um, facing the violence of the European Union, uh, Greece-Turkey um, border regime, uh, and and what it would mean to talk to each other and share stories of struggle, of joy, of thriving, of building community beyond the forces of anti-immigrant sentiment and violence. Um, and really centering uh, the possibility of migrant thriving and life and community beyond citizenship, beyond uh, border uh, imperialism, really. And so I have the, the site of the um, project on there. And so what, what came out of our conversations was uh, this oral history project that I actually incorporate to a class I teach at the University of Utah. Um, the class is called Borders and Migration. Uh, and it's a class that I teach um, as part of a uh, cohort program geared towards uh, the retention of students of color and support of students of color and, and first generation college students. And so as part of this um, project, uh, many of my, uh, you know, my students, many of whom are from immigrant and refugee backgrounds, um, share uh, oral histories that they conduct with family members, with community members, about the theme of migrant justice. Um, and they share these stories with our partners in Greece, who are organizers, who are um, organizing, uh, you know, in refugee struggles, migrant justice struggles in Greece. And then our partners in Greece share oral histories that they conduct with each other with us. And we kind of dialogue and share, talk about these stories and um, the parallels uh, you know, in them and, and um, how to continue being in dialogue to um, build solidarity and what that means, what would that mean concretely, right? Um, I'm gonna move to the podium for a second just so folks can kind of see visually how the exchange looks. So you can kind of see um, here on the, the home page of the site, there are different years you know, that you can go to. Um, and I don't know if it's going to scroll, scroll so we can see this. Yes. Yeah, so you, know, you can see in 2020, we partnered with the Syrian Greek Youth Forum, which is um, a, an organization in Greece and kind of, sorry. <laughs> And um, kind of takes a while to load, but you can see kind of our Greece partners have their interviews um, sort of uploaded here under Aegean Greece Roots. Um, in this case, it was kind of uh, each person pinned their interview to a location on the map um, of Athens that was really meaningful for them. Um, and then, you know, you can, can just kind of see conversations that we've had, and then our students um, posted their interviews here for, for the Greece partners to listen to. So, so just, you know, really quickly, I think in response to the question, um, one of the major, um, you know, themes that emerged for us in these conversations with each other was really the, the role that uh, global capitalist dispossession and imperialism plays in mass displacement. And across all of our stories, we can really talk about this through the oral histories. Um, you know, one of the examples that really illustrated that for us uh, and was really powerful for people in Greece and students to hear this story was um, one of my students whose grandfather actually uh, worked for Chiquita Banana Company in um, Guatemala 
which actually Chiquita was the successor company to United Fruit, um, which some of you may know was uh, the Boston-based U.S. corporation that pushed the United States in 1954 um, to plot a coup d'etat against the democratically elected president of Guatemala in 1954, um, who was trying to redistribute you know, uh, agricultural lands that were owned by United Fruit, this corporation, um, you know, to support landless peasants. And so the US backed this coup d'etat that brought to power a military dictatorship. Um, and you know, my, my student's grandfather, who worked for uh, Chiquita, the successor company of United Fruit, uh, was fired after 27 years of working for the company as part of mass layoffs, right, as a tactic, very neoliberal tactic, obviously, um, for profits, for the company's profits. And so, you know, you had this military dictatorship backed by the U.S., you had these neoliberal policies that directly impacted, you know, a student in my class um, and their, their migration story. And, um, it was kind of a moment of not just thinking about the current, uh, current sort of um, moment of refugee uh, struggles, but also the historical memory of previous, previous periods of migration that were caused by previous moments of global capitalist dispossession and imperialism that my student was bearing witness to and telling the story of her mother and her grandfather. Um, that then allowed us to also bear witness and, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and for, for our partners in Greece to bear witness to that story um, and honor that story and think about how um, you know, it very much relates to these very same crises of violence and dispossession that we're facing today. Thank you, um, Dr. Saldana Portillo, for your introduction, and thank you, Lubna and Alvors. Um, I want to start off by saying, or like highlighting, that as we talk about, you know, communities that are dispossessed and the kind of work we do, that all of you know my co-panelists here, we are part of these communities as well. Um, so this is not just you know like a research topic that we have an interest in. We're very um, invested in you know the liberation and justice. Oh. Oh, I really got to go over my um, We're really actually invested in um, the liberation of our communities. Um, so that's at the core of the work that I do. Um, I've been part of various organizations for the justice movement in Los Angeles and the Inland Empire. If folks are not familiar um, with the Inland Empire in California, Southern California, you know, next to Los Angeles, um, east to Los Angeles is the Inland Empire, which is like very rural, desert town. Um, a lot of people say it's like the place that people don't want to go. Um, but there's a lot of um, activity and you know a lot of um, the movement for immigrant justice and its trajectories really can be traced to a lot of different locations. But I'm familiar with the Los Angeles and the Inland Empire communities. And that's because I did grow up in an immigrant household. Um, my, myself, I'm not undocumented. But I am, you know, what people consider like an anchor baby. Um, I'm the only U.S. citizen in my family, so that's my investment in my community and the work that I do. Um, I've been part of the migrant justice movement since I was in high school. I was part of the 2006 walkouts in, in my high school in, in Los Angeles. We organized uh, the mega marches, and since then I haven't stopped and I won't stop because <laughs> that is that is the real work. Um, so yeah, then I, you know, from, from there, I started doing um, work with youth coalitions um, in San Gabriel Valley, Los Angeles, and, and then I joined the movement to shut down detention centers. Um, and in that movement, well, at least for me, I've been there for four years, but I work with amazing people who are directly impacted, um, which I mean, you know, I work with uh, mostly youth that are undocumented or people who have been themselves detained in ICE detention centers. So people who themselves see the violence of the deportation regime are creating um, organizing tools and resistance. And that's where I joined the movement for you know, deportation defense campaigns and the movement to shut down detention centers. Um, so I consider deportation um, defense campaigns a mode of mutual aid, first and foremost. You know, it's not just uh, like, it's not just um, like charity work, it's, 
it is absolutely mutual aid because this is our own communities. Um, people who are in ICE detention centers like are vital to our survival and our community survival. Um, it's also a, a critical self-defense. Um, deportation campaigns and the movement to get people out of ICE and shut down these places, these places of terror, quite honestly, came from a need of seeing our own family members being kidnapped and detained in ICE detention centers. Um, so this form of activism that we do um, and strategy, what we do is that we are able to link up people who are in ICE detention and you know, give them references for uh, legal aid, for we, we attain their court hearings, um, we visit folks, and you know, visitations mean everything to people. Um, we also fundraise for people's um, asylum cases, for their bonds to be released, um, and we provide post-release support. So working, for me, working inside ICE detention, you know, the folks that I work with, especially ICE detention in California, in um, San Marino County, in Adelanto Detention Center, um, the people that I work with are like people from all backgrounds. Um, so it's kind of hard to pinpoint, you know, one specific push factor, but we could always make those connections because everything's so intertwined. Uh, but primarily, I do work with you know folks who are there is no over representation of folks who are coming from Mexico and Central America, but as well as folks who are coming from Ghana um, and Cameroonian folks. We had a lot of representation, or a lot of people who were um, detained in Adelanto from Cameroon. Uh, then we have folks who are from Senegal and Haiti. Um, and I know a little bit about the context in Cameroon, like. Um, for Cameroonian folks that they were fleeing a lot of repression with the separate state and there was a lot of political prisoners that were migrating here um, and then being met you know, with the repression of the US state and put in ICE detention centers. Uh, the situation with Haiti, for example, um, uh, you know, Professor Saldana Portillo talked about the global um, climate crisis and we see that with Haitian migrants who are displaced due to the earthquake and natural disasters but as well as political conflict and economic displacement. And if we really you know, connect the dots, <laughs> these natural disasters, although they are you know, climate um, cost like catalyst, they also are a product of the political conflict and the economic, um, basically racial capitalism that is ongoing in these places, right? Um, when it comes to Central American migrants, uh, there's mostly folks from Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua and El Salvador. And again, we see the same pattern of political conflict or rather political repression. Um, political conflict is like the term that you know, the US asylum law uses. Um, then we see the aftermath of this political repression uh, manifest through the form of like gang violence. So I, it, it's, it's strange because you know, street violence or gang violence is characterized one way but if we think about political conflict or political repression, that's a form of gang violence too. Um, and there's also like economic displacement as well in all over cent Central America with a lot of the, like, the um, overthrow of governments that we've seen in the last you know, decades all over um, Honduras and Nicaragua. Oh, two minutes. Um, Okay, then I wanted to mention something else about like the population that I do work with. So I primarily focus, or where my support goes to is with queer migrants um, and women in detention. And that's really important to highlight because uh, this intersection of queer folks in ICE detention, right, they don't, a lot of times they do have a lot of um, severed ties with their families, right? So they don't have that support that other folks who are in detention or who are in carceral spaces where they could call their family or ask for like financial support. So that's why we focus on queer migrants as well as the layered violence that folks are fleeing from their you know, country of um, origin. Uh, that's what they call it, um, the country of origin. Um, we have a lot of folks who are from Ghana who are being persecuted um, on basis of their sexuality or perceived sexuality. So that's one avenue that we focus on. Um, but also, you know, I want to bring up this tension between the category of refugee and asylum seeker and undocumented too, uh, because when, when I'm working with folks or you know supporting folks to fight for their freedom in ICE detention centers, um, we don't work with folks who are categorized as 
refugees. Um, in Latin America, we don't really get that category. Um, in Latin America, most folks are, you know, they have to apply for asylum status, but then there's also a layer to it where like other folks who don't get asylum, right, who don't get approved and so forth, and then they're labeled undocumented. So there's layers to these categories as well, uh, which kind of, you know, my co-panelists and I were debriefing before, and we were trying to pinpoint, you know, the overlaps. So there's definitely overlaps with our populations and migrant folks that, you know, we, in populations that we work with, but there's also a way that the state has, um, like, divide and conquered, <laughs> has separated our categories, which makes cross-organization, like, difficult um, to, to navigate. Question. And if we'd like, uh, if each of you would speak about the death voyages that refugees um, are embarking on, refugees and migrants uh, to the global north, the challenges they endure, as well as the steps they take in their liberation. Thank you. Okay, so. Earlier I spoke specifically about Palestinian refugees who are newly um, going on these death voyages, mostly northbound toward Europe. Um, but the largest waves of refugees in the, many, in the last several years to Europe have been um, Sy from Syria, from Iraq, many from Libya, a, a lot from North Africa, Tunisia and Morocco, uh, also many from Senegal and Cam Cameroon also um, arriving in, in Europe. And Afghanistan is, uh, Afghans are probably the largest group actually that the last four years have continuously arrived um, to shores of the European Union. So I think one thing that's very common is that in international law, technically every person in the world has a right to seek asylum. That means that technically anyone can be able to go to any country and apply for political asylum. That's not implemented pretty much anywhere in the world, right? Um, but what ends up happening because of the, the lack of pathways for people to be able to seek asylum, political asylum, or refugee status, is that people have to cross through really dangerous smuggling rings, right? Um, and part of this has to do with the, the way in which um, the crisis in the Mediterranean has developed within the last 10 years. So in 2013, 2012 and 2013, the majority of the refugee voyages were actually going through Libya toward Italy and from Morocco toward Spain. Um, one of the things that we started to see is that Italy and Spain started cracking down on their border patrol by um, using sort of biopolitical techniques of surveillance for refugees, like fingerprinting, uh, which if they were fingerprinted in Spain, which would erase their opportunity to, to, to declare political asylum in another EU country. So that dissuaded a lot of refugees from trying to go through those voyages. The other thing that was happening was that the border control um, militaries, right, um, that were patrolling the waters became very violent and negligent in order to dissuade refugees. So in 2014, there is a famous case of a, a boat of about 250 refugees that were stranded in the waters between Malta and Italy. And there's an audio recording that was leaked about uh, someone on the boat calling the Italian Coast Guard saying, we're drowning, please come and get us. And the Italian Coast Guard saying, you're not in our waters, you're in Maltese waters. And they called Malta and Malta said, we don't see you on our radar. And so that boat actually ended up drowning and all 250 refugees died, right? That was a moment where both the refugees themselves and the smugglers that were organizing the refugee rings started finding alternative paths. And that is the moment where Greece became the main first steps of the European Union that refugees from across the Asian and African continent and um, North Africa and Southwest Asia started accessing. So the way that they would do that is they go through the smuggling ranks, through these different like long voyages, through mountainous terrains, um, trying to get past borders until they get to the point where they get to Turkey. And in Turkey, um, they usually use the same smuggler or, or, or hire a different smuggler to cross the um, Aegean Sea into Greece. And if they successfully make it into Greece, they're finally on European Union soil. It's an incredible thing to actually witness that. Um, when refugees arrive to the Greek islands because 
the, the, their bodies are so weathered by months and months and months of being on the road, like not having eaten, not having seen medical care. Um, but the joy that they feel um, and the belief that this is like going to be, this is the, this is the end, um, is actually something really fascinating to witness because what we now know is that um, the road ahead in Europe is actually very, very difficult. So um, up until 2016, I'm almost out of time, but up until 2016, the main process was that refugees would arrive to the Greek islands if they came from four refugee-listed countries, which were Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, and Iraq. They were entitled to an Ausweis card, it's called Ausweis, which allows them to freely travel from the Greek islands to Athens, and from Athens, they would go by foot across the Macedonian border. And from there, they would go through the main Balkan corridor until they got to the country of their choosing to declare asylum. Most people were going to the Netherlands and Germany because they have the best policies. <laughs> um, after March 20th of 2016, in a deal called the European Union-Turkey deal, what ended up happening was basically a full closure of all the borders. What was required from Turkey was for Syrian refugees only to apply for EU asylum when they were based in Turkey. They would be approved in Turkey and they could fly from Turkey to their EU country. What that meant was that all these other refugees, Afghan, Libyan, Tunisian, from Yemen, from Senegal, from Iran, from, uh, from all these different countries, were not eligible for that. And so the smuggling rings continued but the death voyages became more dangerous and coast guards were attacking more boats in the waters and there were more deaths in the waters. And what ended up happening if people did successfully make it to Greece is that they became basically captured by Greek border patrol and put into what people on the ground call concentration camps. They're former Greek prisons that are now serving as refugee camps, but they're really concentration camps because refugees can't leave them, right? They're, it's, a, it's a prison. Um, and that, I, I'm way over time, but that is sort of where we are still until the current moment, where the pathway to citizenship or residency or applying for, um, for um, asylum is very limited for the non-registered um, refugees in Greece, but the smuggling rings continue and uh, they become more uh, dangerous if things have evolved. So I think um, for us, you know, in this project, uh, when a space to uh, speak freely about how the institution of the border has um, wrought so much violence on our families and our communities. And to kind of do that in a space with each other without the sort of mediating discourses of the media and of, you know, demonizing anti-immigrant, um, you know, discourses, but to speak simply to each other. Um, even for me, right, as the instructor of this course, um, you know, I had never really talked much about my parents' migration story from Iran um, with, with people. It was always something that was very deeply personal, something that was very, um, you know, private for us, but in the opportunity of this project to speak with my students about how if my parents, you know, after uh, fighting in a, in a revolution for freedom in their country, um, and then having, seeing that revolution be derailed um, and fleeing, you know, persecution in the 1980s uh, by a new authoritarian regime, um, and uh, going through this very harrowing journey of smuggling across uh, um, the Iranian-Turkish border, um, a journey without which I, you know, if it had not happened, I likely would not be here. And I think, um, you know, and, and, and kind of speaking, you know, to students about, um, about this for me was also um, uh, impactful, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, and I think these, uh, we can think about different ways that, you know, the, of these journeys, you know, my parents were, my father was almost separated 
uh, from my mother and my sister when they were traveling, which would have proven very catastrophic. So these are kinds of the, the very real, you know, I don't want to downplay the very real um, risks, right, that migrants take in making these journeys. Um, but beyond that, beyond just speaking to, to each other and, and bearing witness to, to the border itself as this institution of violence um, and the regimes that police the borders as, as institutions of violence, uh, also um, speaking to each other about, uh, you know, um, imagining a world where these borders are not here, right? Imagining a world where these borders, uh, you know, do not have the, the control that they do over our lives. And uh, one, one example of that that came through in the project was um, uh, uh, the story that Fares shared. Fares is uh, a, an organizer and aspiring speech pathologist in Greece. Uh, he left his home country of Palestine a few years ago. Um, and when I asked him, you know, in the course of our interview that was shared to, to our project, uh, you know, what message do you have um, for my students? Um, you know, my students are very excited to speak with you. Uh, what message do you have for them? And his message was very simple, and I hope people are okay with me dropping the F-bomb. But <laughs> he said, fuck the borders, and I want to speak to your students about um, I know about the U.S.-Mexico border. Yes, I'm Palestinian. Yes, I'm living in Greece. But I know about what's going on at the U.S.-Mexico border. And, um, you know, and, and these borders uh, will not always exist. And um, I want to be in solidarity with your students about, about what, their, what their families um, have experienced and uphold their struggles. Um, and I think that was really powerful, right, for my students to hear that from somebody thousands of miles away from a in, you know, different context, different, different experience, and also from somebody whose freedom of movement um, as a Palestinian was constrained within his own country, right, of occupied Palestine, thinking of Israeli colonization, the, the, the checkpoints, the occupation, the borders within Palestine, um, itself, right, somebody whose freedom of movement was, was constrained within his own country as a result of colonization, who then, um, you know, left for Europe for a better life, in search of a better life, and, um, you know, was met with entirely new regimes of violence, uh, you know, across borders um, that uh, he was crossing with a friend um, to get to Belgium, right, from Greece to Belgium. Um, and as Lubna mentioned, you know, uh, the process of seeking asylum in Europe is, is very uh, constraining because you have to seek asylum in the first country of arrival, which for many is Greece, but of course, um, the wealthier countries that actually have more infrastructure to support uh, refugees are, are further north in Europe, right? And so migrants do, are forced to take these terribly dangerous journeys. Um, and so, for example, you know, Fares lost his friend uh, crossing the river between Bosnia and Croatia, right? And talked about that in his story, and and sharing that, um, you know, that loss with us was also a way to say, I want to bear witness to the losses that. Um, students, you know, in, in your class and the communities that they're a part of have experienced through the crossings of the Sonoran Desert, right? And, and that um, we can bear witness to this loss together and that these losses are not in vain because we're fighting for a world um, where the border doesn't exist, for a world with open borders um, and abolished borders eventually, right? And that's not just a, a romanticized pipe dream, that's a very real life and death call, right? These borders are, are literally killing people. And so to continue a struggle um, beyond borders uh, is very urgent, is very life and death, and matters quite deeply. Yeah, um, this was, well, um, it kind of was the first time I heard of the term death voyages, um, but it you know, it was very familiar, like it, it makes sense. And we've seen that multiple times and, you know, different iterations um, all over, you know, the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, but, 
That's the second time I did it while I'm talking. It <laughs> <laughs> doesn't like me. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, so I was thinking about this question, and I definitely think, you know, one thing to think about is, you know, who is the person who's migrating and what, what do they embody? And, you know, these death vo voyages also manifest different, not just where they're migrating from, but what they look like, right? So, um, for example, there, for black migrants who are coming from the continent of Africa and crossing from the U to the U.S.-Mexico border, um, they have to go through multiple borders, a multitude of borders, because most folks go to Brazil, right? And then from Brazil all the way up, like, to to the U.S. Mexico border, I can't even count how I haven't counted how many borders they're crossing, but that that's a multitude of borders. So when I think about death voyages, I you know especially for the folks who are at the U.S. Mexico border, it really is um, nuance, uh, but as well like we, we could make the connections as well. Um, so in reference to like Black African migrants, I also think it's important to recognize that. A lot of Latin American states are, you know, anti-indigenous, um, so they also inflict violence on other indigenous populations that are also going through this multitude of borders or these multiple borders, um, and they have anti-indigenous, not just you know, um, populations, but as well as anti-indigenous laws um, or laws that target people that look indigenous, as well as black. Um, it's very anti-black, and we see border enforcement all over. Um, these countries of like from Mexico all the way down to Brazil, um, all countries have their own form of border enforcement and border patrol that specifically target migrants that look a certain way. And one example is, you know, I I was talking to to a man from Ghana, and you know, um, he was sharing his journey with me from since you know Ghana to going to Brazil, and then you know the journey up. Um, and me being Mexican, I've heard so many times of you know the treatment that Mexico has on its southern border. Uh, I, I hear it all the time. You know, Mexico's southern border is very anti-indigenous and so forth. Um, so I thought he would share with me about you know the worst experience he had would be in Mexico and the Mexico-Guatemala border. Um, but then, <laughs> okay, no worries. <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So t talking to to um, this man from Ghana who had oh taken the multiple journeys, he described the worst border you know that he encountered was Costa Rica, and I had never heard of that before. Um, and that's when I realized, like, of course, you know, this is like a black man describing his journey. Um, and it really does, these death voyages do, you know, change and are different um, depending on who the person is and what they embody. Um, with that said, I do want to highlight, you know, the Trump's administration's like attack on asylum, which has changed like asylum policy as we know it. So right in, um, during Trump's administration, he passed the Remain in Mexico policy where usually folks who are, aiming to declare asylum at the U.S.-Mexico border. They tell border patrol agents, you know, that they are fleeing from the country. And then, and then folks will be transferred to an ICE detention center. And then in the ICE detention center, they'll be asked, um, they'll, be, they'll take a credible fear interview. And if they, take, if they pass a credible fear interview, then later they await um, their hearing in front of an immigration, lawyer, um, immigration judge. So during Trump's presidency, he ended that process and made people wait in Mexico while they wait for their hearing. Um, so this caused people to stay in massive camps or tent cities, which are like in horrid conditions in Tijuana. Um, well, I, I was familiar with the Tijuana one, but they have encampments all over the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and these encamp encampments, right? There's no medic, like there's no doctors, there's no medication. Um, there's no access to bathrooms, so sanitation's pretty bad. And then people who are there, they are there for like six months to years, waiting to have you know their asylum court case heard. Um, and people will resort to violence or they or you know theft, but they're also victims of violence as well because they have to find alternative ways of trying to survive in Mexico. Um, on the other hand, when I'm thinking about death voyages. 
I'm thinking about undocumented folks who are crossing, um, who are crossing by foot through the desert, right? So if, you know, we were talking about like climate and the, the role of climate, the climate change in um, dispossession and dis um, displacing people globally, there's a way where the environment <laughs> And the climate change is also being weaponized to act as a border, to, to enact the, the, exactly the death voyages, to do the job of the state. So when we see people crossing by foot in the desert, it is a three day long walk, three day long walk. And there's children, there's elderly people walking, you know, carrying their own water. Um, and then there's also folks who have to cross through the river, through the Rio Grande. And we've also seen the drownings as well. So folks are, similarly dying you know, by drowning. Um, so the parallels are very eerie and morbid. Um, and yeah, then we also have, what I wanna highlight as well is that when we think about death voyages in the US-Mexico border and the folks I work with and community members, um, another side of death is folks who have been beaten by border patrol agents. Um, and how their bodies will never be the same. We, like, I have worked with and have loved ones who have crossed you know, recently and were detained and just beat multiple times by the state authorities. Um, so that's another side of, of a death voyage um, caused by the state. And we recently saw the picture of like, you know, Haitian migrants crossing, um, I believe it, it was through the desert, who were being chased by Border Patrol agents, um, right? And, or they were like, I believe they were in Texas. That makes so much sense. <laughs> like Texas Rangers, actually. <laughs> and the history is telling me it was Texas. <laughs> um, yeah, and we see them being right chased and like with, with like a lasso. And so yes, when when we think about death voyages, it's it's layered. There's a multitude of borders. Um, there's a way that the climate and the environment is being used as a site of death to enact death, but also the state is always there. So I'm going to combine questions to make sure we leave time for a conversation with you all. Um, if each of the panelists could speak a little bit to what's revealed by the interface of refugees and migrants, the interface they have with global humanitarian, legal, and uh, policing border regimes, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the linkages that emerge um, from migrant struggles, articulations, and organizing efforts that are demonstrating people-to-people uh, -people solidarity beyond what's facilitated by these um, immigration and asylum regimes. Okay, yeah. These are great questions, I think. Okay, I think, you know, one of the things that in, in, in my work that I think I've really realized, and it's been sitting with me and it's something I think about a lot is about how, what refugees are up against, both in the terrible violent conditions that force them off their homeland, in the precarity that accompanies them on these death voyages, and then in the violence they endure, even when they get to states of the European Union, for example, is that they live in a condition of impossibility. There's like a, an impossible, set up, right? They aren't allowed a legal pathway to residency. They cannot actually go home because their lives are at jeopardy are in jeopardy. They don't have the possibility to attain legal employment. They don't have the possibility to attain housing. You know, they don't have these possibilities. And I think that on the one hand, it's very catastrophic and it's very sad and we should be paying attention and empathizing with the kind of pain and hurt that they've been feeling on so many levels. And on the other hand, I've learned that they are producing possibility out of that condition of impossibility. They are finding ways not only to survive, but to completely re-manufacture understandings of family, of community, of states, right, um, of what they were doing with each other was mutual aid before we called it mutual aid, you know? Um, in some ways, it's the reestablishment of communes, right, where people can't rely on services of the state. You know, I'd, I'd go to the camps in the, in the islands when refugees were still arriving in large num numbers, and you had probably as many 
volunteers from Europe there, <laughs> maybe not as many, but like a good number of volunteers from Europe, huge nonprofit organizations and international agencies like the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, the Danish Refugee Council, all these big international agencies and NGOs. And yet people kept falling through the cracks. Like there were so many people that were still sleeping outside on a, a snow covered mountain at night without blankets or coverage. There were so many people that didn't have meals for like two days because they didn't know what line to stand in or they didn't have a card to show the f people at the food tent. So the, even the bureaucracy of the NGO refugee industrial uh, aid industrial complex is weaponized against refugees, right? It is a way in which like it's not that it's not there to help them survive and help them integrate or help them live. In many ways, they're actually dying because of it. Um, and so I think that in that interface with, with like these international agencies, what ends up happening is refugees start communicating with each other and thinking with each other about creative ideas that they can do it on their own. They create coalitions with Greek anarchists, for example, to help defend their little squats and camps against attacks by right-wing forces like Greece's Golden Dawn Party. It's a right-wing, kind of a Nazi group that's been waging a lot of attacks on refugees. So they're organizing without even English skills, right, in many cases, with Greek anarchists on how to defend these little homes that they've set up. They're organizing with one another on how to create um, shared home space, who's gonna do the cooking, who's gonna do the cleaning, whose turn is it to pay for what this week, right? Because they can't rely on the UNHCR to provide adequate housing and food and, and shelter and safety. They're organizing with one another on how to protect um, especially young women and girls from the rampant forms of sexual violence that are happening in these camps. You're talking about in Moria camp in Lesvos, before it completely burned to ash like a year and a half ago. This is a camp that had 40,000 people in it with 14 bathrooms, okay? A lot of these people, people are young children. The kind of sexual violence that's happening in spaces that are that overcrowded, where people are frustrated, where people are angry, where there's like no real support or intervention or accountability processes is really difficult. So how people are organizing with each other to create barriers between, you know, of pillows or of backpacks between where the children sleep and where the adult men sleep, that is an act of organizing that's showing a different way of possibility, that's accounting for things like the precarity of gendered and sexual violence in these communities. In Athens, there are a number of refugees who have ended up there who have stayed a lot longer, um, who have stayed a lot longer um, or who've basically had to stay in Greece and weren't able to continue on to another EU country. They're trying to figure out ways to survive, like in a country where even once you can get a residency, you can't really own a business for five years. No one's really willing to hire you. It takes you a number of years to learn the language skills, right? So we're seeing a, a, a wonderful formation of Palestinian refugees from Syria organizing a farm, an agricultural project in Greece, organizing with Greek workers, Greek farm workers, and exploring and bringing um, uh, Palestinian indigenous seed preservation and harvesting practices from Palestine to Greece, right? And it, for them, it's like, this is our way of producing our own food and surviving off of it as refugees, selling it at an affordable cost to other refugee communities who are otherwise eating the same packaged lentils that the UN gives us in all of our houses without any access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So this is a refugee-initiated project. Um, there's refugee to refugee initiated aid work, such as the Jafra Foundation for uh, Youth Development, which said, why are we sitting around here like victims waiting for refu uh, refugee organizations to help us? We should support ourselves and other refugees. We're the ones who know the pain of what refugees are experiencing. Um, and then also, I think like when we're thinking about the interface with the, I, the, this is the, the last point I want to make on this. The interface of these different communities from various ethnic and racial and political subjectivities in Greece. Greece is a country that is still reeling from an economic crisis of 2008, uh, a EU bailout, you know, the, the Syriza, which is a leftist government 
uh, that took a bailout despite a referendum voted on by its people, it's a country that is struggling economically. And it's not just refugees that are experiencing the economic or political precarity in Greece. It's also Greek young people. It's also Greek working class people. And so the kind of solidarities and connections that are being forged in parks and community centers, the kind of intellectual exchange. I mean, refugees are reading literature on Trotskyism and socialism and, and what is indigenous stuff. There was a moment, I think the last time that I was there, well, no, the time before, in 2017, uh, where City Plaza, one of the squats that was really the main squat that had a lot of internationalist presence, Angela Davis came and, and gave a talk. And like hundreds of refugees came to this talk from Afghanistan, from Palestine, from Kurdish refugees. And they're sitting there together with Greek internationals, with Spanish internationals, with Italian internationals, thinking about what is a new internationalism that doesn't rely on the nation state. The nation states failed us. How do we as people from different geographies bring, up, uh, bring about this different world? And the last thing that I do want to say is, last thing, aside from the refugee-initiated projects and work, the internationalist um, presence in Greece has been very important as well. Groups like Mare Libre, Italians, French, and Spanish activists who are taking rescue boats out into the waters to save refugees who are dying and who are being prosecuted in the courts of the European Union. This is also happening here, you know, um, the case with, I forgot his name, from Arizona. The people who are being prosecuted by the government because of saving lives. Um, and I think that this is a really important example of us needing to do what needs to be done to save lives but on the, on the, at the same time, understanding that we have activists and legal and political work to do to challenge the criminalization that is setting us back and that is actually allowing so many people um, to, to perish as a result of these structures. Um, so first in response to the question of uh, the complete inadequacy and um, harms of the legal system. So I think something that Cynthia was speaking to were, were the, you know, the, the legal categories between asylum seeker, refugee, economic migrant. So um, one example of this is um, in 2016, the European Union uh, passed a policy that was called the Joint Way Forward Agreement. Uh, this was a policy that they struck, uh, an agreement they struck with Afghanistan, um, which, and there was also um, a lot of uh, evidence to show that, Afghan that Afghanistan was actually, the government was uh, pressured to sign this policy because it was attached to aid from the European Union. But the policy was that Afghan migrants in Europe would not be considered refugees of war, incredibly, Right, but they would be considered economic migrants, um, and uh, and it completely denied the ongoing conditions, then and now. Right, as we've seen in the last couple of years, um, of war and conflict and violence in Afghanistan. Right, but this was of of course a tactic by the European Union to um, make Afghans vulnerable to deportation, um, and you know, and I think. Uh, some of the stories that, that Afghan refugees in our project, um, Afghan and Afghan Iranian organizers uh, in Greece shared in our project really allowed all of us to collectively bear witness to how different global powers um, and imperialist powers have uh, devastated Afghanistan through 40 years of proxy inter-imperialist war, right? In the 1980s between the Soviet Union and the United States, the United States backing you know, the, the Islamic fundamentalist Mujahideen in the 1980s, exacerbating war um, and creating the conditions for, uh, you know, and, and this proxy war between these two powers, right? Created the conditions that then forced people to flee um, you know, to Iran first, but then in Iran, people, uh, Afghan uh, migrants faced new structures of racism by the Iranian state, by, you know, um, new uh, uh, kind of, again, being told that, oh, you don't, 
you don't belong here, um, limited access to rights and resources like education and um, work, right? Many Afghan migrants are undocumented in Iran. And so, um, you know, someone like Hamed, right, who I opened with as, as someone who I was having conversations with, and this project is very much a result of those conversations Hamed and I had, was born and raised in Iran to Afghan migrant parents and was one of the first residents of uh, City Plaza Hotel Squat. And through this squat, right, talked about experiencing um, a community where for the first time in his life, he felt like he found a community of belonging, right? In opposition to state, state after state after state, right? Mm -hmm you know, that was telling him that he didn't belong, right? And I think, you know, and the squats, um, you know, and of course people have spoken to, and in our project and even beyond the project have spoken to, you know, of course, the, the difficulties of the squats, the internal decision making, the tensions in organizing, right? So I don't want to romanticize, you know, the squats, but I also but want to uphold, as Lobna was mentioning, right, um, the, example of community of belonging that comes with uh, running this autonomous space as refugees, as um, people that uh, have faced the organized abandonment of states, of, um, you know, humanitarian agencies, right? Um, and, you know, um, really a, a statement that has stayed with me from um, another organizer, Narges, uh, a resident uh, of the City Plaza Squad, uh, is we, you know, who had fled Afghanistan for Greece said, we saw that Greece was just like Afghanistan, except without the bombs. What did she mean by that? Well, thinking about the rise of fascist movements, the, the um, border patrol, border agents, the violence people face through the policing and border regimes, you know, the rise of the white supremacist movements like Golden Dawn, the, the fascist party in Greece, um, the camps, right, living, uh, you know, these overcrowded camps like Malakasa, like um, Moria, right, where conditions are very dire, right, show that the failure of these humanitarian legal systems has, has made, uh, someone like Narges say that this is just like Afghanistan, right, except without the bombs. And so to take part in a movement like City Plaza Hotel, to take pot, part in these squatters movements where you take over uh, vacant buildings, right, I think was also very powerful, not only because of the, um, you know, example of uh, mutual aid and solidarity and autonomy that it provided for that grassroots movement, but also because it built this larger consciousness for the people of Athens too.